Uh, so, our kids are in trouble. Our kids are in a lot of trouble. I'm going to tell you about a little trick. There's a lot of tricks being played on our kids. I'm going to tell you about a little trick. So, you know, they're on the internet. They've got their TikTok. They've got whatever it is. Whatever the social media of the day is. It used to be Tumblr. They watch TV. Maybe they're watching Disney. <laughs> Maybe not anymore. Maybe they're watching CNN Plus. <laughs> Probably not. They're probably watching Disney Plus, and you have to ask what the plus is for. So they watch this stuff, and then they're getting these ideas, whether it's critical race theory ideas, whether it's queer theory ideas, gender ideology ideas, whether it's disability studies or fat studies or all of these other dimensions of this identity Marxism fed to them. Kind of taking them off of their base and say, well, that's the entertainment industry. What are you going to do? That's social media. What are you going to do? And so they go to school. And what does the school do? Does the school try to keep them level? No. The school accelerates it. And when you ask the school, why on earth are you doing this? They say, well, they're already being exposed to it. They have the internet. They're watching porn anyway. So we have to teach them about pornography in high school. In fact, we should show them pornography. We'll watch pornography together. Because they're already seeing it, so we need responsible adults like us to bring it to them. And now you see the trick. You have these different domains within society playing off of one another to create this need that then they fulfill, but it's all bogus. So our kids are in a lot of trouble. They're being bombarded from every direction. They're supposed to be innocent. Queer theory, as we'll talk about, explicitly challenges the idea of childhood innocence. It says that childhood innocence is something that's afforded to some children and not others. Those children you might call bourgeois, if you were a Marxist. They have access to a special kind of property called innocence that other people are excluded from. This creates a dynamic in society. And so we have to overthrow childhood innocence. We have to rethink, reimagine what innocence actually means. And so our innocent children are being bombarded by this you know, at home through their entertainment, probably not through you, through their entertainment, through their social media, whatever it happens to be, and then they're going to school and they're getting it reinforced. And this is a catastrophe. There's nothing else to say about it. It is a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe as it's happening, and it's a catastrophe in the making where it's going. I just saw a video, I think it was from New Jersey, but I'm not 100% sure, of a crowd of looks like older teenagers running through a mall, causing mayhem, clearly spouting critical race theory ideas, going berserk. And the first thing that I, I saw this, I, I put it on Twitter, I retweeted it, and the first thing I said, said is this is the American Red Guard. So what's happening to our children, what's happening in our schools is a reproduction of what Mao Zedong did, and Sloan said that this morning. Um, so I'm going to have to talk to you about a few different concepts today that you're probably not familiar with. I'll try not to fire hose you too much. But we're going to have to talk about Mao Zedong. We're going to have to talk about uh, queer theory, because it's a little bit unfamiliar. We're going to have to talk about what's happening in education, particularly education theory. And hopefully I can keep it kind of to those topics, but this is gonna be a little heavy. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about Wade brought up the idea of the slippery slope. I wanna just point out to you that we can't understand queer theory without understanding the slippery slope. Uh, but we'll come to queer theory after Maoism. But the thing is, is that every woke slope is slippery. Every single one. And we're gonna cover why that is. And so just to give you an example, you know, Wade gave a couple of examples of the slippery slope of the throuples and all of this. So you, we heard about the dog paper. Dog parks are, are a petri dish of canine rape culture, and so on and so forth. Therefore, we have to train men the way that we train dogs in order to stop rape culture. That was the thesis of the award-winning paper that we wrote. Well, we decided that, you know, you, know, you can't get more, you can't, my friend says you can't take two bites out of the same cherry. So we can't write fake papers again and, and get get the attention. But we thought, wow, if we did medical journals, that might get people's attention though. Because the medical journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, for example, The Lancet, et cetera, are publishing this kind of stuff routinely. So we thought, we'll go after medical journals. Turns out, we didn't know how hard it is to get published in a medical journal, not because of the quantity, the quality of what you have to write, which was obviously degrading, and we know how to play that game, but because of the, uh, they actually do check their credentials. Turns out they don't want non-medical professionals <laughs> publishing in medical journals. Other academia was a little softer back in the day. So we actually wrote two 
two fake medical papers that never went anywhere, and I, we've given up, so I, I can talk about them now. And one of, this is last year we wrote them. And so both of the papers already come true. It's exactly the future facts that Wade was talking about. One was that we argued that we need birthing equity, and that birthing equity would be based off of uh, black and indigenous birthing persons of color. And the punchline was to get birth equity, we need to encourage white abortion. That last part hasn't quite come out explicitly. All the rest has. Another one we said that we need to stop calling, uh, referring to the Hippocratic Oath, you know, do no harm. Uh, we should call it the hypocritical oath and that we should do away with the, the Hippocratic Oath and we should do harm proportionally to the equity we want to achieve as doctors. And this is borderline come true as well, that they are now challenging the Hippocratic Oath and saying that it is hypocritical at its foundation. They haven't yet discovered that the first time that Primary Nomen Serum, which is the Latin expression of it, it was written, was in a, in a book. This is what our paper did. It's in a book from the 1860s or so, and a British doctor wrote it for the first time. And he has this story in the book where there were these, uh, you know, colonial Indians, and you know, he chased them down and talked about how they're like terrible people and all this. So obviously, it's racist. Uh, so they haven't discovered that yet, but they'll get there, don't worry. Every woke slope is slippery. Even the, like, encouraging white abortion is a thing that will be happening soon, if it's not already happening somewhere. Uh, white castration, you, you cannot possibly make up something too extreme for them to go there. And they are, are totally accelerating. But this is kind of part and parcel with how Maoism works. I've been telling people, we've all got kind of a sense now, I don't want to talk about critical race theory a lot, uh, I feel like I've said the last word on that. It's race Marxism, the last two words, I suppose. That's all it is. It's Marxism recreated using race instead of economic class. Uh, I talked to a Marxist about it last week, and I convinced him that they stole the Marxist engine and put it in a jalopy. And he decided that, that was actually a pretty uh, good description in the end. Uh, so I don't want to talk a lot about that, but I, wanted, I do have to talk about it to get you to understand how the Maoism works. And so, what Mao did, is, as Sloan said this morning, is that they, Mao came out with this campaign to destroy the four olds in society. This was during the Cultural Revolution, which was from 1966 to 1976, when Mao died. Before that, actually, though, critical race theory was used in China to undermine the Nationalist Party, which was called the Kuomintang. So it's often abbreviated the KMT. The, the Chinese Nationalist Party under Chiang Kai-shek had to be undermined, and it turned out the CCP infiltrated it, and they used literally critical race theory to do it. They said that what the Nationalist Party was trying to do was trying to create a unified Chinese identity. They called it Huarong. Huarong means Chinese person. It's kind of a slang term for a Chinese person. And they said, well, there are 56 racial identities in China. One is the Han race, then there are 55 minority races. And they said they're trying to erase all of you minority races and make you all Han. Just like we're trying to erase all the people of color, minority, races and make them all like white people. They have to have a good work ethic, for example, that makes them like white people. And they use this to destabilize the Nationalist Party, and that's how the CCP rose to power. Then they tried this great forward thing. Mao got kicked out of power because he killed a million, you know, millions of people. It was a complete disaster. China was set back. And then he comes back with the Cultural Revolution to depose the people who kicked him out of power. In 1966, and what he did was he, he wanted to destroy the four olds of society, old customs, old, old culture, old habits, old ways of thinking. And so he unleashed young people, university students are easy to radicalize, didn't take too much work, and then children uh, to do this, to destroy the four olds. They're the new, they're young, and we're going to use you to destroy the old. So what they ended up doing was going and destroying temples, destroying the artwork, destroying old cultural artifacts of China like. Chinese martial arts, Chinese medicine, and so on. He went and just systematically destroyed it. They came home and they beat up their parents. They beat up their grandparents. They attacked their teachers and professors if they were labeled with the wrong kind of politics, but more specifically with the wrong kind of identity. Turns out that Mao used identity politics that he groomed children into to create a revolutionary red guard out of people under roughly the age of 25 to destroy society so that he could secure his power. That's what he did. So he separated Chinese people into 10 identity categories. Five of them he labeled as black, and those were bad, and five of them he labeled as red, and those were good. Red is for communism. The five black identities were uh, 
landlord, rich farmer, and sounding very Soviet at that point, uh, counter-revolutionaries, people that are fighting back against what was happening, bad influences, we call them domestic terrorists from the Department of Justice today, and right-wingers, just cutting right to the bone. Right-wing, black identity. The five red identities were peasant, laborer, those who couldn't easily become, but they were given glorified status under the Marxist-Leninist ideology that Mao was employing. So you had peasant, you had laborer, and then the rest are all basically the same thing. You had revolutionaries, you had revolutionary cadres, and you had revolutionary martyrs. So people who played on the side of his revolution or died in its cause, those got red identities. You say, well, you, what good is a red identity if you die? Well, it bestows upon your children as well. So if you had a black identity, your children had black identities. If you had a red identity, your children had red identities or might, depending on what they did. And all you have to do to radicalize kids, anybody who has little kids knows, is you offer them like a piece of candy to turn in their, kid, their parents and they will. It's really easy. All you have to actually do is offer them, offer some kids special treatment and other kids you exclude from special treatment or maybe, you know, psychologically abuse them and make their life miserable. That's all it takes. Some kids get to wear a special hat. They get to put a feather in their hat. They get to wear a little badge. They get to have a nicer lunch. They get to sit at the cool kids table. They get two recesses. It's not hard to create conditions where the fairness impulse of children is, which is, as any, every parent knows, is a bit strong. Uh, the fairness impulse of children can be weaponized to radicalize them. So if you happen to be, say, a landlord, your child has a black identity at school, gets treated like crap, other kids are getting treated good, but if he rats you out to the government or beats you up, he gets a red identity too, and he gets a special treatment. And that's basically all that it takes. So what's going on with critical race theory and queer theory, or the gender ideology, or trans, whichever thing you want to latch it onto, it's all the same thing. What's going on with that is they're creating a one-two punch. I saw a long time ago, I was trying to figure out what the relationship between critical race theory and queer theory was, and I was like, it's like a monster with two fists. And so what the, I don't know, I, I did some boxing back in the day. Uh, you know, you set them up with a left jab and you hit them with a right cross and knock them out, and that left jab that probing little punch that probably isn't gonna knock a guy down unless he's got a glass jaw, that's critical race theory. You start telling them that their racial identity is messed up, that if they're white, they're associated with all of these worst crimes of history, that they get the original sin of racism of this country built into the very, <clears throat> to the very skin color because they happen to benefit from it because they were born that way. They're the worst kind of person, really. They're associated with the worst people in all of history. If they're a minority race, black in particular, well, if they're thinking for themselves rather than being political activists, then they're selling out the cause. They're a terrible person. This is what they actually teach in critical race theory. And that sets them up. There's your jab. And you get a lot of you get a lot of activists out of that. You can get out of that black identity by becoming a red identity, an ally. That's what allyship is. It's adopting a red identity. It's joining the revolutionary cadre. You're an ally now. But you can never do your allyship well enough. You can become politically black, as Napoleon Jones put it, that's his architect of the 1619 Project. It's different than being racially black. She said it in a tweet, she then deleted very quickly because she gave away the game. She said the quiet part out loud. So you give people this pathway just with critical race theory. But the right cross that's gonna knock your kid out is queer theory. You tell them that they're terrible because of their skin color, so they have to become an ally. Their allyship is weak, they're not cool, they're not interesting, they're the most boring kid in class. They don't get any special treatment from their friends. They don't get affirming care or affirming activity from their teachers unless they become pansexual or demisexual or asexual or graysexual or queer in general or trans. All you have to do is say that you don't think that you're a boy anymore or that you don't think you're a girl anymore. Or, as I talked to one young woman a number of years ago, she said that she was pansexual. I said, what does that mean? She said, well, it means I'm attracted to everybody no matter who they are. And I said, have you kissed a girl? And she's like, ooh, why would I do that? <laughs> you put these things together, and what you're seeing is they're adopting politicized identities that they don't realize are politicized identities because it gives them status. 
I talked to a young man in Southern California one day. I had the opportunity to do a thing at, at Chapman University, and then I had a, another thing to do in Los Angeles, and this young man at Chapman volunteered to drive me the two hours up uh, to Hollywood from Orange County. And so we talked the whole way, and he's you know college sophomore or something. He's just out of high school. And I'm like, what's it like in high school right now? And in California, and he says, oh yeah, we, you know, you get your yearbook, you go home, you write everybody's pronouns on it, you go home, you gotta you got go in and change them, you gotta keep up with them, because you're going around every single day and you're using everybody's pronouns with them, and anybody who gets one wrong is just gonna get made fun of all the time. That's all you do. That's all we do. You can't be the kid who doesn't know all 700 other kids in your grades' pronouns. So you go home and study pronouns, not math, not reading, whatever. All day, that's what he told me. The reason is because that gets you into the red identity. And the point of creating these revolutionary cadres out of politicized identities is to destabilize your children, to separate them from their parents, to separate them from their religion, to separate them from their nation, and separate them from their culture. It is to sever those pillars of culture being transmitted from one generation to the next. It is to take your children away from you First, psychologically and emotionally, and then second, physically, because that's what they've architected now. If you don't give your children affirming care at home, this is another little trick, by the way, they set up. This is my war that I've now started to wage on something called the Trevor Project. If you don't give them affirming care, if you aren't affirming their identity, then you're secretly abusing them. They have all kinds of secret ways that they can talk to people at school and you'll never find out. Be affirmed there, be socially transitioned at school, maybe even led to physical transition, being given access to hormones, being signed up for uh, examples of uh, you know possibly getting surgery. And what they'll do is they'll say, well, how do your parents feel about this? And my, my parents would hate it. Well, we don't have to tell them. And the Trevor Project is a whole anti-suicide campaign online, one of the biggest anti-suicide campaigns online that's designed around that objective. And when people try to defend the, pre the Trevor Project, which is pushing people in these directions, which, and you know, we gotta declare our conflicts of interest, is also funded by the pharmaceutical companies that sell the hormones, as it turns out. When they do this, they say, well, we have to, because these kids can't talk to their parents, because that's the problem. We have to have this. So they create and manufacture the same problem. They pretend there's a problem, pretend there's a demand, they manufacture the demand and then serve that demand. It's called selling snake oil. But you're selling literally puberty blockers to children who will be sterilized by them, who will never grow adult genitals, who will never have sex, whose genitals may atrophy. If you put a young woman, a girl, on testosterone long enough, her vagina may actually abscess. You can kill them. They will not have children. They may never experience things like orgasm. They will never have a healthy sexual identity as adults, whether they want to be gay or straight, doesn't matter. And this is what they're grooming them into. And this is the way that they're doing it. And the point is to destabilize them and to separate them from you. To separate them from you, but also faith. I'm not particularly religious myself, but I can understand that it's a terrible thing when the child comes home and says, I'm demisexual, and you're like, what the world's that? That's not the Bible, and you're like, the Bible's obsolete. The Bible is an oppressive book. We don't live by that. That's old news. That's out. That's not American values. Well, America has been wrong this whole time. It's been oppressive for people like me, and you don't understand. You don't understand, Dad. You don't understand. It's different now. And you can just see that the goal is to actually take your children and separate them from you, from their faith, from their American heritage, from their culture, from the nation they live in, and to set them up in a politicized identity that's designed to go out and destroy all of those old things in culture, like old religion, like old parents, like old ideas, like old art, like statues of Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson that have to go on the lake. That's the objective. So the kids can't know who they are, they can't understand what they are, but they know that everything that's come before them is terrible and has to be destroyed. That's the objective. That's what Mao did, and that's what they're doing in schools right now, using critical race theory and queer theory as a one-two punch. So, we're all familiar with critical race theory now. It's race Marxism. Done. Ta-da. I was doing this kind of a little thing with a group in Oklahoma recently, and the state attorney general was there, and I said, well, we've got to talk about queer theory. And he just blurts out, what is queer theory? And I realized nobody knows what queer theory is. Now, 
I don't know, maybe I have to have a mea culpa moment here. A few years ago, after I did these fake papers, and I realized that this was the end of Western civilization, somebody better talk about it. It's like I went into a room and stood before three doors. And I didn't know which door to open. On one hand, I had critical race theory. On another hand, I had feminism and queer theory. On another hand, I had critical education theory. And at the time, I had to pick one. And I was reading some of this stuff, and it was like white fragility, white silence, you know, white anger, white rage, white this, white that, white the other thing, white everything, white mathematics, white empiricism. I was like, wow, that's really, that, that really grates on how proud we are as Americans to have overcome racism to the degree that we have. So I'm gonna go after critical race theory. And I guess that was fortuitous. Maybe that's that's been the right answer, I don't know. But I meant that I did not go after education theory or queer theory, which I'm now trying to do simultaneously, uh, which is hard because they're each two gigantic domains. So what is queer theory? The shortest way to put it is that queer theory is a war against the normal. I could say it's just queer Marxism. Ta-da, we're done. <clears throat> Because queer means, excuse me, queer means abnormal, right? And so some people have access to a special kind of bourgeois property called normalcy, and other people do not. They're excluded from that by the system of considering some things normal and considering other things abnormal. So what you have to do is you have to get the people who are considered abnormal to awaken to a consciousness of their abnormality and the injustice of being classified as abnormal by a society that favors normalcy and wage war on the very concept of the normal and undermine it. It's queer Marxism. It'd be weird to call it abnormal Marxism, but it is, it, that's the idea. That's all queer theory is. Uh, queer theory really kind of is, we talked about slippery slope, queer theory is the slippery slope of feminism, of a particular kind of feminism. There are lots of, one of our other fake papers, by the way, was a rewrite of a chapter of Hitler's Mein Kampf, 12th chapter of Hitler's Mein Kampf. We, we had a guy uh, from Norway come out and say, well, that's not a very, uh, maybe Sweden, Sweden, sorry, who came out and said, that's, that's not a bad chapter of my conflict, like there's some good ones in there. And um, <laughs> that's one of these tricks where you deny the context of where that chapter exists. Chapter 12 comes after chapter 11, which comes after chapter 10, which comes after all the other chapters before that. And so what you have is Hitler explaining why he's getting madder and madder and madder, first at the Marxists and then at the Jews, because he identified them as one and the same. And then later, he starts railing on the Jews, and that's chapter 11. If you want to find the chapter that's properly, truly racist and anti-Semitic to the hilt in Mein Kampf, it's chapter 11 of volume one. Chapter 12 is we need a movement to solve this problem. That's the not bad chapter, apparently, according to this brain genius. <laughs> And so we took that chapter and we erased the word um, our movement or the words our movement and replaced it with intersectional feminism. And then we railed on this other type of feminism called choice feminism, which is that a woman making her own independent choices makes her a feminist because she's a free and independent agent in the world and can do whatever she wants. You know, a strong independent woman don't need no man. Because they hate choice feminism because they want Marxist solidarity around feminism. But ultimately what we're talking about is all of feminism is rooted in social constructivist ideas. Social constructivist ideas is the idea that, say, gender is a social construct, or race is a social construct, or whatever, that society has created social constructs, which is a Marxist concept, of how society is supposed to be ordered and how people are going to be placed into that society according to what class they fall into, their class position. So for feminists, we took up the social constructivist argument. What they argued was that gender is a social construct. I might be a man, or you might be a woman, but I shouldn't feel constrained to have to be manly, and you shouldn't have to be constrained to feel womanly. I can be an effeminate man, and that's fine. You can be a masculine woman or a butch lesbian, as most of the theorists were, and that's fine. You're no less a woman, I'm no less a man, based on how I present, based on the gender roles that I adopt for myself, based on the gender roles or sex roles that I'm cast into. And they waged war on the existing society in terms of so-called sex roles. Men go get the jobs, men go do this, men go do that. Women stay at the home, women raise the children, women are to be meek and something, blah, 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 and not speak over people. I don't know, all these different things that they said were the socially constructed enforcers of what it meant to be male and what it meant to be female that constrained an awful lot of people who didn't feel like that fit them as an individual. And they had, you know, something of a point. 
But the problem is, is when you go into social constructivism, you're on a slippery slope. Every woke slope is slippery because it's in la-la land. So here's why it's really slippery, though. If I say gender is a social construct, but sex is not a social construct, underlying all of this, I'm still a man, you're still a woman, that's what it is. Somebody, somebody, somebody sometime down the line named Gail Rubin in 1984 in an essay called Thinking Sex is going to say maybe we need to think differently. Maybe the reason gender is socially constructed is because sex is actually socially constructed too. Judith Butler is going to echo this in her uh, kind of magnum opuses in 1990 and 1993 and say, well, where does gender even come from? Well, it comes from sex. So maybe sex is socially constructed. And then if you're a feminist who says, no, I'm a woman, but you're not going to tell me what it is to be a woman. But I'm still a woman because I'm a biologist and I know. Because <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't. Which is a transphobic statement, by the way. What your queer theorist, your national queer theorist is going to say is, you've left an awful lot of status quo on the table. You cannot leave status quo on the table. So the slope has to slide. You are being a conservative. You're not willing to go as far as I'm willing to go. If I'm going to say sex is a social construct, just like gender is a social construct, then I've taken the argument further, and the reason you won't is because you have something to lose. You have a special kind of property called normalcy that you have to lose that is oppressing me. There's a violence, Judith Butler. I call her the fairy godmother of queer theory. There's the violence of categorization itself. So now we don't have doctors observing the sex of a baby, they're assigning sex at birth. They are doing a violence of categorizing that person regardless of how that infant will grow up to feel. And it's considered a violence. It is a war on the idea of normal and anything. Anybody who tries to say, this is why the slope is slippery, anybody who tries to say, yeah, I'm with you to this point, but you can go no further, is a conservative, is a counter-revolutionary, is a right-winger. A radical feminist is a right-winger now. And of course, that's one of your black identities under the Maoist construction, so those people have to be destroyed. They can have a red identity by becoming queer. That's what queer theory is. Queer theory is a relentless war on the normal. It is to believe that everything, especially with regard to sex, gender, and sexuality, is socially constructed, fluid, malleable. I'll give you a quote from a woman, I think. No one knows. But the person's name is Hannah Dyer. Hannah Dyer is a leading queer theorist in education. She specializes in early childhood education. I think she, she, she with an X, specializes in in, in early childhood education, early childhood development psychology from a lens of queer theory. And she has this paper that she wrote about queer futurity and the innocence of children, where she argues that the innocence of children is a social construct that maintains this idea of normalcy and needs to be abolished, needs to be destroyed. And she says a lot of people make the mistake of believing that queer theory is about creating stable LGBTQ identities, but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, it is about creating, making sure that those identities stay fluid that they never become stable. And the reason is because the Marxists through the middle part of the 20th century, really starting in the 60s going forward, realized that the problem that keeps Marxism from getting in play in the West is stability. The working class became financially successful, became a middle class, and they became stable, and they became conservative, and they became counter-revolutionary. That's the words of Herbert Marcuse. So they are no longer a revolutionary.